I'm going to say okay. It's not like the guy from South Park. <laughs> so this is, this is, this is Isaac, Isaac Newton. Uh, back in the 17th century, he had this concept of space and time, which reflected well how people thought about it. They, they thought of space and time as something that didn't change. Space was how it was and, and couldn't ever be altered. It's, it's a backdrop that things happen in. It doesn't do things itself. You could never say space did something. Time is the same way. Time progressed, and, it, and you could set your clocks to it. It could never do anything different than what it always does. Okay. Well, that was a reasonably good way of looking about it at the time. But in the 20th century, we learned that it's just simply not the way it is. So this is Albert Einstein, as you know. And he says space and time are related to each other and that they both can be warped and deformed and changed. They're dynamical, changing things, space and time. So I have a pet peeve about this picture. Um, you recognize this picture, but in fact, this is really the Einstein that was really important. This is Einstein from 1905. In 1905, Einstein did his work that got him his Nobel Prize. He wrote the paper that proved atoms existed. He did the first paper on quantum physics. He invented the special theory of relativity, and among other things. This was Einstein's big year, often called the miracle year. Yet you never see that picture. So the 24-year-old Einstein was really the hero of physics, not the 60-year-old Einstein we always see pictures of. This kind of gives you the, the different ages. So invented quantum physics, special relativity, proved that atoms existed. And then there's this guy who in his 30s invented general relativity. And then there's this guy that you always see the pictures of that frankly didn't do much. <laughs> he spent his whole life, later life, working towards building a unified theory that never came to, to fruition, he never, he, never succeeded. But he did get a pretty good developed start on it. I don't think so. I think his field theory has <laughs> almost no merit. <laughs> well, he never completed it, so you never know where, never knew well, where he's going. You can, you can like, observe what he did and then make a conclusion from that. All right, so, so in, in this paper, this general theory of relativity, which this particular Einstein invented, um, he had this equation, all right? This relates energy and mass to curvature of space and time, okay? So the more energy and mass you have, in, in space, the more of that space becomes deformed. That's essentially the force of gravity. Okay? Gravity exists because matter and ener energy are deforming space. Um, but the weird thing about this equation is that if you study it over the universe itself, over cosmology, it says that space should be growing or contracting. Okay? Space should be getting bigger or getting smaller. Einstein didn't like this. Einstein felt for, frankly, non-scientific reasons, it's just for personal, philosophical reasons that the universe should be static. Space should be what Newton thought it was, this unchanging background. Um, so in order to make this equation predict an unchanging universe, he added this extra term called lambda g nu nu. And that lambda is the cosmological parameter, cosmological constant, that enabled the universe to stay fixed, if you fixed it to a very special background. So he knew the truth, but he didn't want to believe it. I guess so, yeah. He should have known the truth anyway. OK. Einstein, however, was wrong. He was in time. This guy, Edwin Hubble, who was a Chicago local, by the way, um, in 1929 observed for the first time that space is growing. It's expanding. Okay? Einstein didn't need this silly term in his equations after all. So this is more or less what he was seeing. If you look at objects that are very distant, a megaparsec, that's a million parsecs, right? So each megaparsec's uh, uh, three million light years or so. So these are very, very distant objects. This is a billion light years away here and much farther. These objects are moving away from us. And you can plot them on a straight line. Okay? So the farther you look at something away from you, the more it appears to be looking, moving away from you because the distance between you and it is getting bigger. Okay? And that's true with everything. The only reason we don't notice it locally is because the amount of di distance between me and the tip of the stick, is the, the, the amount of, of, of rate that that's growing is so small you can never see it. But if you look 
at distant galaxies and clusters of galaxies that are billions of light years away, you notice they're moving away at a considerable velocity. Is it constant? Well, it's constant. So the, the question was, is this rate of expansion the same everywhere in the universe? And we don't really know for sure. To the best of our observations, it appears to be the same or at least similar. But we have fairly weak, and weak observations. The best thing we can do is say in that direction, things are moving away at the same, same speed as in that direction, as in that direction, as in that direction. But you know, we, we have our limits and our ability to tell that for sure. So this leads us to ask this question of what's our ultimate fate of our universe, right? So if you put into Einstein's equations, you take out that silly cosmological term that he put in to make things static, and just say, now, how's, how's the universe's size and history going to evolve? Well, we know it's expanding now. That's what this means here, right? We're somewhere in here. If there's a whole lot of matter and energy in the universe, eventually it will come to a stop, and it will contract again, and contract down to an infinitely dense kind of anti-Big Bang. On the other hand, if there isn't as much energy and mass in the universe, it will continue to expand forever, and it will never close back on itself. But it will eventually slow down. In fact, it, it, it makes, in either case, the expansion rate should be slowing with time now. Right? Um, and up until, I don't know, five or ten years ago, ten years ago anyway, we didn't know which of these kinds of universes we were in. Isn't it? <laughs> All right, so we want to know whether we're in an open or closed universe, right? So you need to look back even farther in, in the history of, of our universe to, to, to get a better handle about the expansion history so we can find out which of these two we're in. And they, they use these objects called supernova, specifically type 1a supernova, um, to, tr to try to understand this better. This is an example of this a particularly nearby type 1a supernova, 1987. And it's, it's incredibly bright. That thing just appeared out of nowhere in the sky. That's, that's not a, a you know, especially powerful telescope. That's just, that just an amazing, uh, amazingly bright object when it exploded in the sky. So when you use more powerful telescopes, you can look at, at, at a much more distant supernova, and you can use these to tell you how, how, how fast that, that point in space is receding from you. And when they did it, they found that we're not on either of these trajectories, but something more like this. Not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding ever faster, faster and faster. But this isn't what Einstein said should happen. <coughs> so to give you an idea of what could lead to this, let's just start with some, some simple equations. So, okay. Normal matter and energy slows the expansion of the universe. You know, it decelerates it, right? So essentially, the, you put matter in the universe, and it has gravity, it pulls itself together, and it prevents space from getting bigger. It tries to slow it down. That's what Einstein's equations say. Acceleration is negative g times mass. But if there's also a pressure built into space, okay, then the equation gets changed accordingly. And if you had a negative pressure built into space, it would actually throw everything apart from each other, gradually accelerating the rate of expansion. Wait a minute, does the pressure push out? So would the negative pressure like suck in? So some of these words kind of contradict the way we normally think about them. But when I talk about pressure, I'm not saying a pressure in space. I'm saying it, it, it actually a matter of, of how, what, you, what, you, what you're saying is, is correct, but it's a matter of just semantics, why people call it negative and positive. But it's, it's okay. So if, if you're confused by that, just think of it as, as a, a general force that's pushing everything apart. Okay. So it turns out that if you put a pre-existing pressure into space, that's this cosmological term that Einstein originally put in to make the universe static. It's a different value. It's not the same size but it's the same kind of term in his equations. So despite you know, his original uh, motivations for using a term, it turns out nature actually does require this to be present. Okay. And another way of thinking about it is that this pressure means there's a certain energy built into empty space. Yes, there's something in empty space. 
I take this cubic meter space, and I take every single molecule out of it. I take every single photon out of it. I take every neutrino out of it. There's no particles in it whatsoever. It turns out that there's an energy in that amount of an intrinsic energy built into space itself, even when it's empty. We call it vacuum energy, or more recently, we've known that we've become uh, used to call it dark energy. So this is kind of a chronology of these, these events. In 1917, Einstein, to make the universe static, said there should be this cosmological term, this cosmological constant. 1929, Hubble discovered the universe is expanding. You don't need the cosmological constant anymore. In 1934, he said, I have a big mistake, biggest blunder of my life. Okay? 1998, only nine years ago, astronomers found that, in fact, this kind of term does exist in, in nature, although it's very different way Einstein originally imagined. This is a pie graph of our universe's composition. The overwhelming majority of it is this dark energy. That's what most of the energy in our universe is, 73%. Dark matter makes up another big chunk, 23%. And then all of the stuff we know from personal experience, all the atoms, all the molecules, all the solids, liquids, and gases we experience are at oh, that's 4%. A measly little 4% of the cosmic pie. Makes you feel insignificant. All right. So we'd like to be able to say some things from this sort of picture about what ultimately will happen to the universe. And if we just take our, our really limited understanding of these things now and just <clears throat> allow them to run forward, we simply take the equations we have that, that allow us to calculate this line and let it run forever, then our universe will become infinitely large and infinitely low density and cold. It will be an enormous big chill. It will have uh, you know, no, no dramatic events in the future. But we don't know that's the way it's going to happen. It could be that right around here, some new quantum field comes into play. And it's really important, but we don't notice it now. And that might suddenly cause us to come to an end. We don't know. Um, so I, I inherited this parts of this talk from one of my predecessors, Rocky Call, and he had. Well, not good. Okay. Oh, cool. Let's go one at a time. This is how he imagines our universe. This is a future going. Um, he's, a, he's something of an optimist. So this is not so optimistic, but uh, but eventually we know that's going to happen in 17 billion years or so. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the universe ends. So he imagines that eventually it does turn over. We don't know what might happen. And somewhere in between there, <laughs> it's going to work out. All right, so we don't know how our universe's future is going to turn out. Um, we have some idea of what's going to happen, but we, ultimately we don't know. Our universe's past, though, is another story. We can actually look back in time and see how things work. So just like a historian or, or an anthropologist can go and look for relics of things and, and study how things might have been at some time in the past, we can do that as cosmologists too. All right, so this is kind of a picture of our universe through time. In the beginning, we had a singularity, not totally unlike the middle of the black hole, but we call it the Big Bang. That's when the universe was infinitely dense infinitely hot, and it's possible that was where our universe came to be, and that there was nothing before it. Where did it come from? You can't, you can't ask that question. And if there was nothing before it, then technically... When I say there's nothing before it, I said it includes time. Time itself came into existence in the Big Bang. So from there, rapidly the universe accel accelerated in expansion, grew super, super fast in a process called inflation. A few hundred thousand years passed, and this radiation was produced. It's known as the cosmic microwave background. We've studied that in detail. It's all around us. If you turn on your television, that's static. About 1% of the static you get, not if you have cable. If you're a fashion like me, you turn on channel 1 where there's no channel, and you see static, about 1% of that static was produced at that point from the Big Bang. <coughs> so time passes. 400 million years after the Big Bang, the first stars are forming. Galaxies, planets, etc. Boring, boring, boring. Now we're here. You believe it or not, everything interesting happened in the first three minutes. 
So let's look at that look at that early part of the Big Bang even closer. So this is at a measly 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang. All right, all in that little little tiny fraction of it. Okay, it's hard to imagine a time that small. So that's when this inflation happened, when the universe got instantly, dramatically bigger. Um, so let's see, I'll read this. I haven't read this slide until now. Expands from the size of an atom to that of a grapefruit in a tiny fraction of a second. So it becomes actually, like, really, I mean, it's hard to imagine how big that is and how quick. Think about that with uh, particles and that existed back then. All types of particles existed. Everything had Everything. It was so hot that everything. Things that didn't exist now probably existed. Absolutely. At 10 to the minus 32 seconds, which it might seem like a long time later, but it's still in that very first instant, the universe was 10 to the 27 degrees Kelvin or Celsius, um, and it, all of the types of matter that can possibly exist. It's, it's so hot that it's like you're inside of a particle accelerator all the time. Okay. So the, we build accelerators to build new, to create new kinds of matter. The whole universe was a particle accelerator in that time. <coughs> And then it cools, and then you're at a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. It's still 10 to the 13 degrees. Um, for the first time, the quarks congeal into protons and neutrons. So before that, it was so hot that essentially the protons and neutrons that they existed would have melted. Okay. Here, they actually cool enough to begin to form protons and neutrons. Time passes, and now we're at a whopping three minutes after the Big Bang. And those protons and neutrons begin to form nuclei. So you begin to see things like uh, deuterium nuclei, lithium and helium nuclei, things like that. Then quite some time passes. Now we're a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. And for the first time, protons and electrons combine to form complete atoms, hydrogen atoms. And when that happens, it releases a whole bunch of radiation that before that was captured. And that radiation is still around us today. It's this thermal bath we live in. It's everywhere. It's really hard to see, but we've studied it in great detail. It's very real. A billion years after the Big Bang, you begin to see giant clouds of gas that form in you know, galaxies, stars, planets, and all this stuff we know. And here we are. This is a little bit out of date. It says we're at 15 billion years now. We're actually at 13.7. That's the age of the universe as we understand. Well, that's, this is kind of the same thing. All right. So let's look at that very beginning, that, that instant following the Big Bang after inflation, where all of these types of particles exist in what's known as the, the primordial soup. So we're a tiny, tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, enormous temperature. <laughs> all right, in one soup can of volume, okay, there's 50 times more mass than the entire Earth. That dense. Um, not to mention another 50 times the mass of the Earth in antimatter. So there's roughly equal amounts of matter and antimatter at this time. And with all this, there's one tiny extra matter particle. Why is that important? Why is it important that there's a little bit more matter than antimatter? Um, one, because they made the all matter in the universe, and two, how can you make one without the other equal? Okay. So, look around your world today. It's all matter, right? There's almost no antimatter. This table, that wall, that ceiling, my shoes, all matter, no antimatter. What happens is that there were a billion particles of antimatter and a billion plus one of matter in wow. the very beginning. I'll get in the very beginning, a very early universe. All those particles cool, collided with each other, and destroyed each other, right? Except for that one bit of matter. Okay. All those one one bits of matter is what makes a world today. So that means there must be some asymmetry in the laws of nature that slightly, just slightly favor matter over antimatter. But we don't know exactly where that comes in. But we know there must be some sort of asymmetry, and we're looking for it. Well, maybe when the Big Bang happened, it blew two universes. All the matter went one way, and all the antimatter went the other way. Could be. Which Inflation way, could do that again. Which would explain why there's not a lot of antimatter in our universe. Well, but, you know, they were made in almost equal quantities. Almost equal quantities, just slightly. 
Okay, so it's not just condensed. It's also extremely hot. So in one of these cans, there's so much energy, it's about 10 billion years of total energy output from the sun in this amount of space. And it's made up of everything, every kind of elementary particle. So it's just over half of the particles in this soup are gluons, are quarks rather. Um, some gluons, electrons, Ws and Zs, neutrinos, photons, gravity. We don't know those are real, but that's what Ron put in this slide. It takes bosons, and then a lot of dark matter, although it's hard to know exactly how much. So, in this way, an experiment like the Pevatron here at Fermilab is a time machine. The, the greater the energy we can collide particles at, the more we can understand what the laws of physics were like in the Earth. Okay, so what happens at time equals zero? That's what we call the Big Bang itself. So. so we can go back and farther and farther in time, but it doesn't really, we haven't so far asked what happened that very first, before 10 to the minus 42 seconds. There's supposed to be a picture there. Oh, Okay, so at time equals zero, we're talking about a, a space-time singularity. That means that there's an infinite amount of density an infinite amount of pressure, an infinite amount of temperature, and space and time are infinitely curved. That was the very, very strong gravity. It's absolutely, it's the strongest gravity you can possibly imagine. It's an infinite amount of gravity. And how does anything get away? Um, gravity doesn't work the way you think it does over an entire universe. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive in that sense. You can, you, the more energy there, there's there, the more so considered expanded. Uh, space time is infinitely curved, and there is infinite space within that small amount of area. Nope, no, not necessarily. Um, it could still be an infinitesimally small amount of space. We don't know that. It could be either way. So, when you curve space and time, it gets stretched, right? So, you can ask yourself, you know, if I want to go from 10 to the minus 43 seconds to 10 to the minus 44 seconds after the Big Bang, how long will it feel like? And it might feel like a very long time. Curvature is curvature so big that it stretches time. So in the closer you get to time equals zero, the more it gets stretched. And eventually it gets stretched infinitely, and time itself stops. Okay. So the more you stretch it, you stretch it more and more and more and more. Time moves more and more slowly. And eventually, when you reach that singularity, when you reach infinity, time comes to a complete halt. So that's what I mean by there is no time beforehand. So time got stretched so much that it actually comes to a complete standstill. But why did time start? If it's at a standstill, then what could be motion? Well, it's, you, you shouldn't ask why did it do something, right? Um, okay, how did it start? No, but that, that's the same same question. What I what I mean is that um, you know we're used to thinking about events in time, right? You can't ask about events without the context of time. You can't say, you can't talk about an event happening, such as time starting, without saying time exists. So you can, the only thing you can do is think about it, I, I think the best way I can think about it in a way, and different people think about it in different ways. But I like to think of it as looking backwards in time and seeing how far you can penetrate. So I can think back and, and see things get slower and slower and slower, and I know that no, ma no matter how many events I look at, no matter how deep back in time I look, I can never get the time just comes to a halt. And as far as we know, that's the beginning of time and space. As far as we know. Okay. So, as far as we know is actually a, a fairly important phrase. Let's, let's ask ourselves the question now, how do we know the Big Bang actually happened? And that this whole thing I'm talking about is actually true. Right. So, let's apply, uh, let's see how you can apply the scientific method to, to the cosmology. So we can't study the Big Bang itself, right? We don't have any tools to do that. We have to use what we can see. We have to use observation. Well, we know Edwin Hubble observed that space is expanding, right? It should, it should say that. Um, so Edwin Hubble has this observational tool to offer us. So we have at least this to confirm that that aspect of Einstein's um, theory is correct. We also have the light chemical abundances, okay? 
So I said before, in, the, in about three minutes after the Big Bang, all of the hydrogen, deuterium, lithium, um, etc., that was formed uh, was formed then. Right? Basically, what we see in the universe today, in terms of these sorts of chemical elements, are what is predicted by the Big Bang. There's about 25 percent um, of, 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 of the mass of, of the atomic masses in, in helium, 75 percent in hydrogen, a little bit in other things. Exactly what's predicted by the theory. So again, we have a confirmation of the Big Bang picture um, from that measurement. And thirdly, we have this background radiation that we see all over the sky. It's three degree Kelvin, almost almost zero degrees, three degrees, barely over half zero, that that we're bathed in. We've studied it in, in, in amazing detail, and you see this this sort of pattern over the sky. And that was produced in about three hundred thousand. So we have these and, and others, but these are three of the strongest indications we have of the Big Bang hypothesis being valid. Um, it's never been shown to be, be faulty, and it's one of the more successful scientific theories at the point. But there are limits, right? For example, none of these things tell us what happened before three minutes after the Big Bang, right? So this tells us that over the last few billion years, several billion years it's been doing what we think it's been doing. This tells us that the, the, about three minutes after the Big Bang, stuff happened the way we thought it happened. And this tells us that a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, things were happening like we thought would be happening. But we don't know what happened at one second after the Big Bang. We don't know what happened at 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the Big Bang. These are things that we have not tested. They're only part of the theory. We have no reason to think they're wrong, but we don't know they're wrong. They are, they're known as the flatness problem, the monopole problem and the horizon problem. I'll go through each of these. Okay, so the flatness problem essentially comes down to this. You can find space curved in different ways. It can be curved um, in a closed way, like this, where if you go in a straight line long enough, you in principle come back to where you started, like walking along a, a line of uh, latitude, latitude or longitude or longitude rather on the Earth, okay? Because the Earth's surface is a closed two-dimensional surface. We can imagine our world is a three-dimensional closed surface. So you actually walk around it if you walk straight down. You could imagine it's curved in the opposite direction. It's a little harder to describe that, so I'm, I'm not gonna go into much detail on it, but the curvature could be open instead. Or it could be flat, which is kind of the Euclidean picture that you learn in geometry class. In fact, you expect that, from the Big Bang Theory, you would be surprised if you were in a flat universe. Okay? If the universe, in the, in, 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 as it was originally created, was just a little bit curved, either way, then eventually it would be even more and more and more increasingly curved. Okay? So these are kind of the more natural places to find the splitting in. Well, that's how we find ourselves. So we're perplexed, or at least, at one point in time, cosmologists were really perplexed by why are we in such a flat universe? We shouldn't be. We didn't expect to be, but we are. I'll come back to a solution to these other. The next problem is something called the monopole problem. So, magnets, if you have a picture of a bar magnet, say this thing's a bar magnet, I have a north pole and a south pole, right? That's a dipole. That's what we mean by a dipole. I break it in two, now I have a north and a south pole, and a second magnet with a north and a south pole, right? There's no way to make a magnetic monopole, a north pole without a south pole, or vice versa, right? Well, isn't an electron technically a monopole? An electron has electric charge, but not magnetic charge. Oh. So you're looking for something with a net magnetic charge. As far as we know, there are no such things in nature. But in principle, we think they should have been created in in huge numbers of them, magnetic monopoles. But we've never seen one. That leaves us uh, quite confused. And we'd like to know why we haven't seen one. And the third problem is known as the horizon problem. This basically comes down to the fact that we <laughs> see the cosmic radiation from the Big Bang, the same there and there. Now bear in mind, these have both been traveling in straight lines from the respective distances 
since 300,000 years of the Big Bang. So it's been almost 14 billion years they've been traveling, and they look identical, or as, as, reason, as identical as you could possibly imagine them. So you ask themselves the question of how did they know the coordinates? Um, let's say uh, you have two friends, and they're uh, at opposite sides of you, and they're going to flash flashlights at you and tell you something. And they weren't allowed to talk to each other beforehand. So they each flash you a message, a series of numbers, say, and they both flash you the same sequence of numbers. That would be awful weird. Right? Um, that's what we're looking at here. So let's say they were trying to cheat. Okay? Let's say one of them said, I'll oh, send a signal to my friend and tell him send 11010. Okay? You could imagine that they're cheating. But they're sending flashlights, right? So there's a speed limit. Light can only travel at a certain speed. So the guy across there can't talk, talk to that guy faster than they talk to me. So there, something's weird there. So the horizon problem is, is, is a testament to it. the fact that we're from all points in the sky, stuff sending us a message at the speed of light. Somehow they're talking to one another faster than they talk to us. Um, maybe it's because we're in the enclosed galaxy. Our enclosed universe and it's going that way. So you think it's a closed universe? Like, like well, it could. well, but we see the universe is flat. That 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 was the first problem, right? So uh, it, it, we we would know well, if it wrapped around it. Well, it's flat. Yeah. It's represented by. So how can we prove it's flat? So there's a solution to all three of these problems. One solution for three problems that's that's very economical, called inflation. So. Inflation says essentially, well, I already mentioned that. I'll, 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 I'll remind you what it means. In the very, very first instant after the Big Bang, space got much, much faster, much, much bigger, much, very, in almost no time. Okay, so, in an vanishingly small amount of time, we went, you know, we got, I forget how many powers of bigger, but we like the, the example, an atom to a great degree, dramatically bigger, than the speed of light. much faster. Than so, when, if you take a, a, a balloon like this, or a sphere, say you're standing on it and it looks curved to you, okay? You can, let's say you're on a small enough planet that you can actually see the curvature. You can see the rounded horizon. And now you inflate that suddenly. It gets bigger, 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 and pretty soon you look around and it looks flat. It looks, it's just like if, as if you shrunk, okay? It would be no good. So, you solve the curvature of the universe simply by making it bigger. The monopole solution, or the monopole problem is also solved because by doing that, by making everything bigger, you dilute the number of monopoles. So even if there would have been monopoles all over, by the time inflation's over, there's a whole lot more space and the same number of monopoles, so the density of monopoles gets vanishingly small. So you never notice that. They probably exist, but you'd be lucky to find them. The monopoles? Yeah. Oh. So the problem is, is after the Big Bang, you expect a whole bunch of one or the other, a whole bunch of North Poles and not South Poles, so they won't make up. Kind of like we have matter in our universe today. How would you have a monopole, though? Because the or like, isn't magnetism the orientation of the electron just getting around the head? So imagine, though, that there's some sort of particle kind of like an electron, but Unlike an electron, it has magnetic charge in addition to electric charge, or in, in, instead of electric charge. So we, we don't have any intuition for that because we've never seen one. But um, if we didn't have any electrically charged particles, we couldn't imagine them very easily either. So this is kind of like that. So the third problem it solves is the horizon problem. So now it's said that this expansion happened at way faster than the speed of light. So that's allowing your two friends across the, the distance uh, opposite directions from you to cheat. So they were really close to each other before inflation. They said 100101, zero, 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 one. okay? Okay. Expanded, inflated, and then they sent you All right? So it allows you to get over this communication problem. That would have really jacked some, some things up, expanding faster than the speed of light. Um, yeah, but it happened at a time 
when we were just in this primordial soup age, and uh, you know, it wasn't very delicate back then. So you, you could you could uh, mess with it pretty extremely before it, um, causing problems. So there's one really. This is the thing I'm going to close with. This is a really crazy conclusion that you get from inflation, and we don't know this is true, but it looks like it should be. When a universe expands, it, can, it inflates. So this this is um, a universe inflating. Right? Different parts of space will stop inflating at different times. Okay? And we're in a universe that stopped inflating, right? But this part didn't. And this part didn't. And this part didn't. And when they continue to inflate, different parts of their universe stopped inflating at different times. But where are they inflating to? Um, so all, there, this is all spatially connected. If you travel far enough, okay, if the universe stopped expanding suddenly, it became suddenly static time stop, and you could move around, you could travel throughout this network of universes. But the expansion was so fast that it's a very, 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 very fast. So, it's like if you if you move far enough, if, you know, you travel away, you know, hundreds or thousands of billions of light years away, you would maybe enter a, a different inflationary zone where a different universe is formed. But where are these universes in the too? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the, 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 the different universe popped out of a different piece of space, very, very distant from us. But you see those bubbles? What's outside those bubbles? Nothing. The bubbles are where the space is. Just like you can't talk about time without outside of time, you can't talk about space outside of space. So there's some really weird things about this. Furthermore, like when inflation happens, it's possible that the universe that kind of bubbles out won't be like ours. The laws of physics could be different in some of them. Maybe there aren't electrons in that blue universe. Maybe there, there's a different kind of particle with different properties. Well, if the Maybe the atomic structure is completely different. Maybe the, the you know, who knows? It, it, it's, it's completely open. So this is a way that an infinite number, or almost infinite, a vast number of, of varied and different universes could kind of grow and stem off of a single inflation, you know, inflationary universe. <coughs> Another weird thing about that is that your brain, you know, these are not causally connected to one another. They're really separate. So traveling at the speed of light, you can't, or, or the speed of light or less, you can't go from universe to universe. Because they expanded away from each other, or grew away from each other at a speed greater than the speed of light. Uh, let me let me say a couple things and I'll take some questions. So these are totally causally disconnected from one another one another. There's no reason why this inflation can't point to that. In other words, this universe had a, a son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-great-grandson, and maybe that's that universe's father, mother. You can break causality here. So you no longer need a big bang. It can be a giant circle that universes create each other without a beginning of time and without a beginning. Uh, how can you make something before it's made? You can't talk about time. Because there's no causality here. Because you can only talk about time within a space-time framework. But nothing, but nothing can happen if there's no time. Again, you can't talk about time that way.